I'm here with Stephen Manel, who is um, an expert on Norbert Elias, and um, he is very involved into Norbert Elias research for many decades now, we have to say this honestly. <laughs> yes. And I'm asking him uh, some questions about his past with Norbert Elias and his presence, of course, with Norbert Elias, and maybe the future of Norbert Elias and figurational sociology. So um, let's begin uh, very early in, uh, in your experience. What is your background? How did you come to meet uh, this kind of sociology? When did you hear of this kind of sociology for the first time in your life? Oh, uh, that was um, after I had already become, become a, a junior lecturer at uh, the University of Exeter. Mm -hmm. um, when I went in 1967, mm -hmm. and I, I've told the story um, in in an article in in print, in fact, uh, about how uh, I had never really heard of Norbert Elias. I, I, I we possibly need to talk about what happened before I heard of Elias, but I I not really the name was very distantly f familiar someone might have mentioned it in a lecture at Cambridge but um, I didn't know his work and it was one of those extraordinary coinc uh, chances I was sitting talking to a colleague in Exeter from the economic history department Mike Morrissey who um, said one morning that his his wife, Grace Morrissey, had a good degree in German from Manchester, but that she was holed up in their small house in Dartmoor in Devon, looking after children, which of course is the fate of so many women, and, but that she had heard that there was a lot of worthwhile German sociology that needed translating, and I, I, I said, well, I believe so, and I could take advice. I could also help with technical terminology, mm -hmm. although my German isn't really very good. And uh, she was not a, a sociologist. And thing, what, things went from the, it, it, maybe as, as much as two years went by. I was taking advice about classics that perhaps should be translated, and my professor suggested, uh, this is a, a coincidence, he suggested Alfred Weber's uh, Kulturgeschichte als Kultursoziologie. Yeah. Uh, and absolutely no publisher in London was interested in, trans in, yeah. in a translation of Alfred Weber. And then word got round publishers and said they, one of them approached through an agent, they approached me and said, would we like to translate a little book that had just been published by someone called uh, Norbert Elias, Norbert El Elias, um, mm. uh, Elias, mm. um, uh, called Vassist Sociologie. Mm -hmm. And at first I looked back through the correspondence fairly recently, and the interesting thing is that I, my first reaction was that won't do my career any good at all to translate an introductory textbook. <laughs> and um, of course, the, the, poor, the, the, the London publishers had bought the rights to Vassist uh, mm -hmm. Sociologie mm -hmm. uh, under the delusion that this was a general introduction to sociology, whereas, as, as we know, it's really uh, Elias's major statement of his own theoretical position. And uh, I, the story is, is, is a long one, but I don't know whether you know the, the, the background. There was a series of little books published in America by Prentice Hall called, mm -hmm. uh, with various areas of sociology, mm -hmm. religion, political sociology, urban sociology, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the Juventa in yeah. uh, Munich bought the rights to the whole series, and at some point, uh, um, Elias was in conversation with um, the name suddenly escapes me, the professor at then at Berlin, um, in Berlin. Uh, the man who had supported Elias from the early 60s. Anyway, we'll come back to Klaassens. Klaassens, of course. Dieter Klaassens. Dieter Klaassens. Yeah. And uh, uh, Elias <laughs> said to Klaassens, 
um, it, the book, the introductory book, What is Sociology, mm -hmm. was written by Alex Inglays, mm -hmm. uh, who is a famous sociologist that I've been to lecture, uh, one or two lectures at, at Harvard by. Mm -hmm. And Norman said, well, whatever sociology is, Alex Inglays has no idea <laughs> what it is. And so that's how Elias came to be writing the German introduction, which is on a, a completely higher intellectual level. I mean, the, the Inclays book is terrible. Yes. Um, and um, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that is sociology and, or what is sociology is. It's a misleading name for the book, a title for the book. Yes. And um, and not many first-year students would be able to make much sense of it, I think. But it made an enormous impression on me. And so we embarked on the translation after I'd been persuaded that it was not trivial. And uh, we finished it by about 1971 or 2, 2 I think, mm -hmm. probably the complete text. Whereupon Elias sat on it. For, and this is, this is a very uh, common experience, several other mm -hmm. people have had the same experience. Mm -hmm. um, you could not get him to sit down and go through a list of words, you know, how do you want this word translating in Norbert, how do you want to then get something else translated. Yeah. And uh, eventually, I think in the beginning of January 1975, already three years had gone by. Yeah. didn't meet Norbert in person until 1972, but I corresponded with him before that. 1975, yeah. my wife and I, Barbara and I, went up to stay with uh, Elias in his house in Leicester, and the yeah. idea was that we would go through the translation. Yeah. Well, first of all, he had lost the, t the typescript, and you have to remember this is before t uh, a photocopier, yeah. so yeah. I think I did get a photocopy made because we were down to the carbon copy, I sent that. When I arrived, he had lost the first three chapters, so we started working on chapter three, the introduction, chapter one, chapter two had gone missing again, and... Um, so we started trying to go through chapter three, the game models, the Spiel, yep. Spiel model, uh, which I think is the thing that influenced me most of all Elias's work initially. Um, and instead of going through it and just checking my translation, uh, he uh, started dictating the beginning again from scratch. And everything that he said, and I had to sit at his typewriter and time, and everything he said, he'd said already in the text, but it was in a slightly different order. If you look at the translation as it's published, it's just ever so slightly different, because afterwards I made a synthesis of the old version yep. and the new version. But this is, I mean, Elias was an impossible man. In, in those sorts of ways. And this was not unique to me. Everyone else had the same experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a wonderful story about Eric Dunning. They had, he and, Eric, uh, he and uh, Norbert had a, tran uh, a contract with Routledge to translate Vassis, um, uh, sorry, uh, Uber Dane Protest, uh, Civilization. Yeah. And uh, Eric tells the wonderful story. I mean, he finished the first volume, same experience, couldn't get Norbert to sit down and go through it systematically, and Norbert started dictating Norm. They finally had one of their very infrequent rows when mm -hmm. uh, Norbert said to uh, Eric, You know, Eric, my dear, in the 1930s I gathered a lot of material on masturbation, but I wasn't able to use it. I think we should r write a new section. Whereupon Eric lost his temper and said, Eric, uh, nor that we have a contract for a translation of the book as it stands. And for about two weeks they didn't talk to it. But this was a very common experience. So you just told me about uh, you being involved in these activ activities in the 1970s and organizing a conference in 1980 and you were very much organizing at this time uh, in, in the life of Norbert Elias. 
what were your intellectual contributions in this time? What, what did you f do in research? Oh yes, well I was um, at that time in the first from about 1979 onwards. Mm -hmm. I I decided that I would like to do a piece of Elias style research of my own, which uh, Norbert very much encouraged. Mm -hmm. um, and the topic that I seized upon, I, I should explain I didn't have a doctorate. All, <laughs> all, all of these things are quite astonishing uh, now. Yeah. You know, the very early appointment by telegraph, things like that. Yeah. I didn't have a doctorate until I was, I think, 41. Anyway, uh, so I decided to do, I was interested in food. Mm -hmm. My wife is was an enthusiastic cook and gatherer of cookery books and we mm. both got rather interested in this and so at first I had a very uh, vague idea that maybe it would be possible to do something with cookery books rather mm -hmm. like Elias had done with manners books mm -hmm. and I, I, I said this to him and he, he wasn't so encouraging mm -hmm. but it was interesting that once he decided that I didn't know anything, it turned out that he did know quite a lot on the subject, even of food. He mm -hmm. read so much social history. So, cut a long story short, um, my hunch was correct that um, the book that I published in 1985 called All Manners of Food, Eating and Taste mm -hmm. in England and France from the Middle Ages to the Present, Mm -hmm. uh, was um, an enormous success as it happened, mm -hmm. but my hunch really was correct that when I started looking at old sources like cookery books, mm -hmm. it stood out a mile that French folk cuisine had been formed in uh, the court society of the mm -hmm. Ancien mm -hmm. Regime, so it was uh, more inspired by uh, Elias's book, uh, the, the Court yeah. Society, Die Hovische Gesellschaft, yeah. uh, than uh, it was direct. No, the civilizing process played some part as well because I, I also wrote about the civilizing of appetite, about how okay. uh, the need to control one's food intake and it became mm -hmm. a modern problem because most of the time in the past, mm -hmm. food supplies were unreliable. People didn't have to ex exercise self-restraint. That led on to things like um, bulimia and anorexia okay. nervosa. So I, it did, but mainly the, 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 the guts of the argument were, was that um, France and England mm -hmm. diverged mm -hmm. because of it. And somewhere along the way, I, I, was, I was sending chapters for comment by Joop Houdblom in mm -hmm. Amsterdam, and one morning, sitting in his study, he said, would you like to put this in for a doctorate at Amsterdam? Mm -hmm. And I said, but I don't have any connection with the University, a formal connection with the University of Amsterdam, to which he hoped, said, you do now. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very strange, but it's very different from a British doctorate. You had to um, you have to defend it in public, much more like the German system, of course. Yeah. And um, Joop had to persuade other, I think, another five Dutch professors to um, agree that this book was worthy of it, uh, a, a doctorate. But it was um, quite an enjoyable uh, experience, mm -hmm. um, and it was. I was quite relaxed, partly because I had just fairly recently stood for Parliament, so I was very much in the gear of um, mm -hmm. being able to speak in public and, mm -hmm. and so yeah, So, and, and the, the, uh, the ceremony, the, the public defence took place with Norbert Elias sitting right in the middle of the front row. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was 1985. Yeah. Um, if we carry on the chronology, after yeah. that things went downhill a bit between me and Norbert because yeah. um, one of the 
problems was that I wanted to advocate Elias's approach to doing sociology, yeah. as indeed did Eric, and by this stage quite a lot of people. Yeah. But it was still a problem that no one real, very few people understood how Elias's ideas fitted together. For example, the theory of civilizing processes yeah. is related to the theory of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the theory, if you like, the sociological theory of knowledge and the sciences. Yeah. But it's not obvious, and uh, probably I didn't understand it as much, as much at first. And so I said to Elias that I wanted to write, to write a book about his work to, to yeah. explain it and I, yeah. I, I remember it led to a bit of unpleasantness because Elias said why I while I am alive Stephen I am the best person to explain my ideas and I wanted to reply oh no you're not <laughs> but I didn't dare say that but it, it wasn't one of his strong points to be able to show how his he, he's brilliant at connecting up so many aspects yeah. of social life, yeah. but he wasn't very good at explaining to other people how the big picture the was formed. He would, formed yeah. Brilliant vignettes, he would explain his ideas with some small illustration and you think, wow, that's really brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. But it didn't really convey the big picture and that's what I did in my next book, which was yeah. uh, called... Um, originally called um, uh, Norbert Elias uh, Civilization and the Human Self-Image mm -hmm. and it was reissued in paperback under the I think rather boring title of Norbert Elias an introduction yeah. but he actually did try to stop me mm -hmm. writing it and uh, in retrospect I think it was in considerable part because he thought I was going to write a biography. Yes, but you didn't. I didn't want a biography. I, I, of course, there's a first chapter which completely reflects. It, it's not as you know yourself. It's actually not very accurate. And even then I probably mm -hmm. knew that it wasn't terribly accurate. But Elias was still alive. Mm -hmm. And um, if I were to try to probe deeply and show where he wasn't completely telling the mm. full story about his life. He mm. would have been very offended. So I just, I read his autobiographical letter in, in Dutch mm. and I summarized it. And, mm. then I, and then the rest of the book is an exposition of as many as possible of his uh, publications and how they're related to each other. Yeah. Um, some, some books came later like um, the Society of Individuals had not been published, or had just been published when I, I, I was publishing my own book. Um, but it, led to, it never led to a complete breach. Mm -hmm. uh, he always spoke, he always uh, talked. I went to see him. Um, you know that his working methods were very odd. He would rise late, like a, really like a 90 year old uh, graduate student, he would get out of bed quite late in the morning and he would spend the morning, as far as his eyesight permitted, correcting what he dictated the next day, uh, the previous day and then mm -hmm. uh, at two o'clock he would start dictating to various Dutch assistants mm -hmm. um, and uh, he would work through till about 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. I'm quite the opposite. I tend to get up rather early. And when I was at the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study for a year, I would ring him up and he would, and I was writing the book. Uh, I would say, can I come and talk, uh, see you, uh, Norbert? And Norbert would say, yes, come round for a drink at half past 10 at night. And I would have to drink. <laughs> and drive up to Amsterdam and oh, yeah. drink whiskey with him and <laughs> oh, my God. not that and then I was completely tired and he was completely fresh. Okay. And, uh, Did you drink a lot of alcohol at this time and you said whiskey? Uh, drink he loved whiskey. He, his yeah. favourite whiskey was Chivas Regal. Chivas Regal, okay. Which is a high class blend. Yes, yes. Um 
never saw I never saw Norbert on in any sort of influence of alcohol. No no visible yeah. even hint of slight drunkenness. Okay. But uh, he loved his uh, whiskey, yeah. Whiskey, yeah, particularly. So you were at this time you were writing the book, and I know that Norbert had big objections against the title of your book because it had to be this, his name on on the mm. cover, and he said uh, you cannot use my name on the cover because uh, it gives the impression that it is a book by me. Uh, how did you? No, react that was to this? A, uh, well. Yeah. I mean, I stopped writing it for a while, but then yeah. Richard Kilminster said he was going to write a book as well, and at that point Norbert uh, realised that it was he was being King Canute holding back the, the tie. Um, yeah. Well, I know, your story's not quite correct. I only found this out afterwards. Of course, it's... Um, <clears throat> the... Um, it's really the, the cover, the, the, the dust wrapper that he objected to. Yeah. But he, it's only in retrospect. Mm. And uh, I wasn't there, but I think Eric Dunning was, and he saw mm. Herman Corter winding up mm. Elias's anger after it had been published. Mm. Uh, there's a copy of it there, um, mm. and you'll see that, yes, it can be read as... Mm. Uh, a book by Norbert Elias called Civilization and the Human Self-Image, whereas the title was actually Norbert Elias colon Civilization and the Human Self-Image yeah. by Stephen Mennell. Yeah. Uh, but I had no control over the way the publishers did that. And so, okay. But, but I, I think um, uh, Hermann had just published his own small biography as well, and I think... Uh, I think there was a certain amount. Around Norbert Elias in the 1980s, there was something like Die Hervische Gesellschaft. It yeah. was a little courtly circle with yeah. people jockeying for position. And, uh, um, I mean, I only found out indirectly that Hermann had put it into uh, Norbert's head that this book now looked like one by Norbert rather than about Norbert. Mm -hmm. Um, two things. Um, things were a little bit strained in late 1989, but you know, we there was never a complete break mm -hmm. uh, between us. But um, when the book came out, um, I had already accepted a chair at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going off there, and I think it was right at the end of June, something like the third week in January in 1990, it was really only a week before we were going to Australia, mm. and I saw Elias for the last time because he mm. opened Maria Hauptblom, put on a, a party, a, a farewell party mm -hmm. for me, and Norbert was looking very old, and I suppose yeah. you might have thought perhaps he wasn't going to last very long, though that didn't occur to me. But Norbert came downstairs, and he said there were two things that showed that he actually there hadn't been a total breach. He said, "I think after all, Stephen, your book may do some good." 